Hi, I'm Heath, the Astro Tour Guide, and welcome to my channel. On this channel, I'm going to focus on things that are interesting to beginning astronomers. If you've just gotten that first telescope, you've gone out and you've found the moon, and now uh, you say, what next? And you read about all these cool things, but you go out in the sky and you just can't find them. We're going to spend some time and help you to try to find those uh, deep, faint fuzzies in the sky. But on this first episode, I thought I'd take a minute and spend some time talking about accessories. We all know that we need a telescope first, and you've probably already gotten one if you found your way to this channel. I will spend some uh, episodes probably talking about some actual telescope reviews. Uh, and in fact, we're going to start with this very common beginner scope that I bought specifically for that purpose to talk about beginner scopes. But um, today, I'm going to assume that many of you uh, have a telescope and you've probably gone out and you found the moon and now you're wondering what else. Uh, possibly you've gotten on to some forums like Cloudy Nights and you've seen uh, recommendations and guys talking about high-end equipment. And it becomes bewildering uh, figuring out what you need to get next and what's most important and do I really need a Teleview eyepiece or could this um, $20 Swabini, uh eyepiece really work. So we're going to talk about all that today. So uh, I'm just going to dive into what's in my toolbox and, and some things that uh, you might consider in a beginner's toolbox. So uh, without wasting any more time, let's talk about uh, one of the first things that I recommend that uh, you get, and that is actually not telescope equipment, but uh, this, a Rubbermaid box. I have this Brute commercial uh, series one, and just because it has thicker plastic, and so uh, when I fill it up with the heavy stuff that I'm carrying around, it can take it, uh, unlike some of the cheaper ones that you see at Walmart, they uh, tend to fall apart. But the one thing that is underappreciated about one of these, this is a 20 gallon size, is uh, when you take all your stuff out of it, and that's the first thing I do when I get to the site or I go to the backyard is I lay all the stuff out on my truck bed or on my table to get everything set up. You can set this thing uh, on its side on a portable table, and now all of a sudden it becomes a dew guard. It will shield your laptop and your iPad and even your eyepieces from the cold of the night sky and keep them from doing up. So it works as a dew shield for all your stuff, particularly your laptop. So if you're going to go out with your laptop or even uh, your journals and binders, stick them in here and you can open them up, stick a little light in there, and all of a sudden you've got a great way to protect your stuff from the dew. So I really, really like the uh, Rubbermaid box for that. And then it has the side advantage of you can put all your junk in it. So once you get your box, what else do you put in it? Well, some things first that we might not think about, uh, get a torpedo level. These are really handy for setting up your tripod and uh, most of them come with uh, magnets. You can even clip them onto your telescope. Uh, this is really particularly handy for setting up electronic scopes that need to be north and level starting out, like the Mean ETX series and I believe the Celestrons work that way as well. So, you know, you can, this is a Craftsman, so I think it was like $15 at uh, Lowe's, but you can go to, you don't have to have an expensive one, just go get a cheap plastic one at Harbor Freight for uh, two, three, four dollars. Uh, these are really handy though, I like having this in my box. Next, uh, bug spray. Down here in Florida, we need this year round, but uh, anywhere up north where it gets colder, you're gonna want this in the summertime when we spend a lot of our time out uh, looking around and uh, you know, when the sun goes down, the mosquitoes come out, so don't forget the bug spray. Now, pro tip, don't spray this anywhere near your telescope. This thing can uh, do nasty stuff to the coatings on your uh, lenses and mirrors. So uh, make sure that you're nowhere by your telescope or anybody else's. If you're at a star party, go downwind and get this on or apply it at home before you uh, even get out. But I still keep it in there in case I need to reapply if I'm going out for a late night. Another thing that uh, we don't think about a lot is just a basic towel. Uh, I keep two or three of these towels around uh, over the night when the dew starts accumulating. I can wipe stuff uh, off uh, like my hand controllers or 
a computer if I left it out. And then when you're taken down, you can kind of get most of the moisture off of the outside of your telescope before you pack it up. Uh, you're going to want to, when you go home, open that back up to dry it out. Anyway, but this helps to get it. So I keep a couple of big ones for that job, and I keep uh, one or two small ones in my box just for wiping down the little stuff that uh, gets dewy over the course of the night. So keep you a couple of towels in there. Uh, that's really handy and something that I didn't think of for a while and I kept forgetting. So a good thing to have on your checklist. Next, uh, a binder. I like having a little uh, leather binder with uh, the, you know, I can put in hole punch pages. And what I keep in mind is uh, I have these, uh, you can use whatever you like. I print off these American Association of Amateur Astronomer Logs. And uh, they're really handy for logging what you see. And as you get into this, this becomes really handy. I recommend you start this from the very beginning because if you start in the Astronomical League trying to uh, do some of their programs, then they require that you document your observations. So that's very handy. Also have uh, some sketching logs. I think this is from the Royal uh, Astronomical Society of Canada. They make some really nice ones that I printed off and I can do sketches. I'm a big fan of sketching. I'm going to talk about it a lot. Um, even if you're not artistically inclined, uh, documenting what you see is really nice. And uh, these days with digital photography, everybody wants to think about astrophotography, but that doesn't document what your eye sees. You do those long exposures and you bring in extra colors and extra things that when you're out there visually just looking through the eyepiece, which I'm a big fan of, uh, the only way to really record what you're seeing is to do a sketch and it's not uh, as hard or intimidating as it may sound. So I keep those as well. And then I have some tabs for the different programs that I'm working on. I'm currently uh, trying to uh, finish the Master Observer program in the Astronomical League, and uh, that helps me uh, for each program. I make a little tab and I keep the requirements in there and any notes and things that I need to find it. Next up, I keep a clipboard. Uh, just handy dandy for sticking in the page that I'm working on so I don't have this big binder out. I just take one or two sketching pages or, or logs and I stick them in my clipboard and go from there. So uh, that's something that I recommend. Also, uh, some drawing pencils. I've got a full set because I like to sketch. You may just have two or three, but keep you some pencils and pens handy uh, and stick them in a little box. Uh, I bought a, a simple... Um, drawing pencil set from I think Hobby Lobby. You can get them on Amazon too. I'll put a link uh, down in the description for some uh, good basic sets. They're not expensive. Really handy to have for all that stuff. Next we move into some electronic stuff and one of the first things that you're going to want to get is a good red light. Uh, there are these uh, handheld ones. This is the Wally Shine 3 mode LED it was a whopping $8 on Amazon. I really like this one because it's got a little clip so I can clip it on my shirt or on a pocket on my jacket and it'll be pointing down and have my hands free uh, when I'm setting up or taking down. It's a little bright for using when I'm not setting up or taking down. So uh, I don't use this while I'm observing. I just use this when I'm getting set up or when I'm taking down. The next one that is very common, a lot of people really like, is the headlamp. The pro to this is, like I mentioned, Clip and the other one, uh, you can work hands free. So you put it on your head and do it. But the one thing you want to watch out for is I don't like the ones like this one that I'm holding. Uh, it's got uh, the white light on one button and another button gives you a red light. But you have to cycle through white and then red and then green. And there's no way to go straight to the red. So it's really hard to turn this thing on without spoiling your night vision. You know, you try to close your eyes or cover it up. Uh, so I recommend getting one that uh, is red light only if you're going to do the headlamp option. The one that I like, uh, I don't have it here, I think is the Honey Red LED. Uh, it's uh, like $16 on Amazon. I'll put a link to that in the description as well. A pro tip on this, if you're using this and you're at a public area star party, try to turn it down 
uh, where it's pointing at the ground. Uh, that way, when you walk up to somebody, you don't blast them in the eye, because even though it is a red light, it still can be bright, and it's a little bit annoying to uh, other people when you come up on them and you splash them with a really bright red light. So uh, that's something that I recommend uh, getting in the habit of, is trying to turn it down a little bit. Uh, the next light that I really like is the um, Celestron Night Vision LED flashlight. I'll put a link to that uh, in the description on Amazon. It's a whopping $10.37. What an odd price. Uh, in the comments on that, the reviews, I noticed and almost didn't buy it because people were saying it was cheap and it wasn't well made. But um, I ended up buying it. I'm glad I did. I use this a lot. It's got a little lanyard that I can hang around my neck and keep handy. And uh, I use it a lot when I'm sketching because it has a, a variable rheostat. So I can adjust the brightness to just the right amount. I can get it turned down, uh, which you don't see in a lot of red lights. It's hard to find ones that you can have a variable, infinitely variable uh, brightness. And that's great when you're trying to sketch because even with the red lights, uh, any little bit, it can dilate your eyes and make your night vision hard. So when I'm going back and forth from a sketch to the eyepiece, I can turn this way down. And on that note, a pro tip on any flashlight that you have that has a lens, one of the things you can do, this has two LEDs and they make little circles and they have hard lines uh, on your page, but you... Uh, cut out a piece of wax paper and tape it to the lens and it diffuses the light so that it's evenly spread across your paper and it makes it easier when you're doing sketches or even just uh, looking at a star chart and looking at those tiny faint little dots you can adjust this thing so i really like this for that reason i keep it on uh, my neck all the time when i'm out observing the last thing that i'm a fan of is uh, this uh, red led flex light I got this on eBay. I'll try to put a link to that. I don't know if you, I can put a link to uh, maybe to the guy that, that sells them because you know the listings come and go. But uh, the guy's uh, name or gal is Angler557. So maybe he's fishing in the dark. But uh, this is a red LED flex light and it's a USB plug. This thing's designed so you can put it in your computer and shine it on your keyboard. And it's awesome for that. But it's also really cool because you can plug it into a battery, one of those extended charger batteries, and then you can stick that battery wherever you need it. The one thing about that, though, is uh, it took me a while to figure this out. It was annoying me to death. You plug it in and it puts out so or takes so little voltage that the batteries would just shut down. And so, to go with this, if you're going to use it for that and uh, not plugged into your computer for your keyboard, I really, I found this uh, battery doing a little research. It's the Voltaic Systems V25 6400 milliamp battery. It's uh, $29 on Amazon. Uh, this I paid about $13, including shipping on eBay for. Uh, but what's great about this, this thing was designed for low voltage trial devices and could be recharged uh, using solar panels, I think. So you plug it in and when you turn it on, it'll stay on. It won't shut down after a minute because it doesn't sense that there's a voltage draw. So it's great. When I pair it with this, uh, what's really awesome for this thing is that I can uh, Velcro it onto my clipboard or I can put a piece of Velcro receiver on a telescope and you can stick this thing wherever you need it and then turn it and just put it right on your uh, eyepiece or not on your eyepiece but on your uh, sketching pad or your star charts or wherever you need it or just set it down inside your box and light up the inside of your box. This thing is just really, really super handy. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, best uh, $29 and $13 combined that I've ever spent. The next thing we need to consider is eyepieces and really um, the other things that I've been talking about are just miscellaneous stuff. You, know, you need a red light uh, but the big purchase when you get a telescope that you need to do is to get some eyepieces. The Most telescopes come with eyepieces but especially if you get a beginner model like this uh, Mi Polaris 130 um, I'm going to talk about this scope uh, probably in my next video and I actually like the scope. I didn't think I would like it because I'm used to using uh, more 
advanced scopes, but uh, the scope gives a pretty good view. When you get it collimated and set up, it does a good job, but it's terrible uh, with its eyepieces. It comes with some cheap, plasticky, just awful, awful eyepieces. Some of the next level up scopes that need sales, uh, they give their basic uh, super plossils, which are decent beginning eyepieces, but shame on you, Mead, for the things that you throw in that 130. They're just awful. I, I, I haven't thrown them away, but I threw them in a box. Uh, not worth the time. So, what do we do in choosing an eyepiece? First thing you need to think about is the magnification. What magnification uh, are you going to get from the eyepieces that you select? And one of the common mistakes that beginners make is we want to see things as big as we can get them. And so we go and we order that two millimeter or four millimeter eyepiece thinking that it's going to blow things up and Saturn's going to be huge and fantastic. And we get it in there and I've even seen reviews on Amazon of some eyepieces and the guy says, this thing's terrible, it's so fuzzy, I can't see anything, it's an awful eyepiece. And it's not the eyepiece that's the problem, it's that you've magnified it too far uh, for the ability of your telescope. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what the maximum magnification that your telescope will support. And that's actually a function of how big the diameter of your scope is. So the diameter of your objective uh, will decide the maximum magnification that you could go to. And a good rule of thumb for that is about your diameter in inches uh, times 50. So if you have a 10 inch scope, you can roughly get a maximum magnification of 500-ish. Now that assumes that you have a perfect seeing night, and those are very rare. So again, if you just jump to something, if you have a 10 inch scope and you go get the eyepiece that's gonna give you a 500X magnification, most nights it's gonna be fuzzy and not uh, appealing. Really, on most nights to get about um, 30 times your diameter in inches is gonna give you uh, the best view that you can get that night. But 500, you know, 50 times the inches is a rule of thumb. If you're uh, in millimeters for the rest of the civilized world, uh, take your uh, diameter in millimeters and basically double it. So for like this uh, Polaris 130, it's 130 millimeter scope, it's five inches, that's about 260 uh, X magnification. The next thing you need to figure out is how to know your magnification. And that's a simple formula. You take your focal length and you divide it by the focal length of the eyepiece. So for instance, if you have a thousand millimeter focal length telescope, then uh, you take a 25 millimeter eyepiece, you're getting about 40 X, 40 magnification. So that's how you know your magnification and the maximum that you can go to. But even then, I don't recommend going and buying the highest magnification, lowest millimeter eyepiece first to get that biggest view that you're going to be able to get. You'll find that as you're out there observing that most of the time you're going to be wanting the widest field of view that you can get. And once you've found something, you'll start stepping it down and just seeing how big you can get it uh, with it still being sharp and in focus. And so my recommendation is to start out with the widest one. A 25 millimeter in your 1.25 inch eyepieces is a, a really good first one to start. And that's typically what comes with most telescopes. But even then, uh, you might want to consider buying that one first if you're upgrading to some nicer eyepieces. So let's talk about some eyepieces uh, specifically that we should consider. And this is going to be based on your budget. If you started out with a you know, $150 telescope like this Polaris 130, you probably aren't going to spend $400 on eyepieces because uh, you just can't afford it. And that's the problem that I see when I go online at Cloudy Nights. Some of the recommendations, the guys uh, tend to just say, hey, just don't waste your money on these cheap ones. Save your money until you can get a Teleview Nagler. Teleview eyepieces are great. They're the really some of the best that are out there, but let's face it, a lot of us can't afford $250, $300, $400, $500 for an eyepiece, and so if they had to save until they could get that, it might be three years. And in that interim of three years, you need to get a good eyepiece that you can rely on. So if you're in a budget category, one of the things to consider that a lot of beginners really like is a zoom eyepiece. And there's two really that I would consider. 
if I were going that route. The uh, Celestron 8 to 24 millimeter, it's 69, I think, dollars. $64 on Amazon. Uh, very well rated amongst beginners. Uh, it, and the nice thing about it is you put that uh, eyepiece in and you can just click it and zoom it from 8 to 24 and so you don't have to be changing eyepieces and finding your focus all over again. You can just click it in. The field of view changes as you uh, zoom in and zoom out. It goes from about a 40 degree field of view to a 60 but uh, that doesn't bother people and a lot of beginners really like this eyepiece. Another eyepiece to consider in the zoom eyepiece market is the Savabini <laughs> company. That name just kills me. I don't know how you say it. One day I'm going to go and talk to them in Hong Kong and, and they can tell me officially how to pronounce their name. But it's S-V-B-O-N-Y. And they have a 7 to 21 millimeter eyepiece for $49. Uh, it's very well uh, reviewed on Amazon. I haven't looked through it personally, but I have used some of their stuff and they seem to be putting out pretty good stuff for uh, a budget price. So another one to consider. I would, if I could only afford one eyepiece and uh, you know, 40 to $60 was a big deal to me, then I would either go with that Svobini 7 to 21 or the Celestron 8 to 24 for $50 to $65, depending on which one you choose. The one criticism for a zoom eyepiece is that you get a reduction in contrast and not as sharp and crisp of a view as you'll get through a fixed focal length eyepiece. And for that reason, a lot of people, myself included, tend to prefer the fixed focal lengths and swapping them out. And when you try them, you'll see that they, they are sharper, they're more contrasty, you'll be able to see more. And in that realm, you have some options, again, based on your budget. If money is super tight, uh, but you can come up with $130 instead of $60. Uh, one thing to uh, look into is the Savimini uh, IP set, the red line set, uh, the ones that have the, the red uh, lines on them, hence the name. Uh, it's about $129 on Amazon, and it comes with four eyepieces, and it's very well reviewed uh, for a budget eyepiece. Again, they're not going to be Teleview eyepieces, but they give a good, sharp, contrasty view. Um, pretty good uh, field of view at 68 degrees. And the only criticism that I've seen is that you have to get your eye position just right to avoid uh, the stars on the outside kidney beaming and getting a little angle of distortion. But beginners don't have a problem with that. A lot of people really like them. You get in there and you have a nice field of view. And it's a four eyepiece set. It comes with a 20, I believe a 15, a nine and a six millimeter eyepiece. So that gives you a good range of magnifications and for $130 that's a good one to consider. The next step up in cost and quality and what I really recommend, I use these myself, I like them a lot as a beginner eyepiece, is the uh, Celestron XL LX series. It's a 60 degree field of view and you can see they're beefy, they're a good size eyepiece and uh, they're very well made uh, they give a pretty sharp view all the way to the edge. Just a little bit of coma on the outside on some of the bigger ones, but not bad at all. Beginners aren't even going to notice it. And uh, so I like the build quality on these, but one of the things that I really like is that they're par focal. And so that means if you get all your eyepieces in this series, when you swap from the 25 to the 18 to the 12 to the 7, or the nine is uh, you just barely have to tweak your focus. They're designed so that you drop them in and they'll maintain a focus from one eyepiece to the next. And that's really handy. I, I can't express how much I like having that feature. It's why I keep going back to these. I've got better eyepieces, but I like these. I use them a lot uh, myself. If money's an issue, what I recommend that you do is start with the 25 millimeter and then uh, step down to the 18 millimeter. And then for my next purchase, I would recommend getting uh, the XL LX 2X Barlow. And uh, what a Barlow does is it doubles the magnification and halves the uh, effective millimeter of the eyepiece that you have in there. And even if you don't go with the Selectron uh, LX eyepieces for your choice if you get those of any or, or something else 
uh, if you're gonna invest in a Barlow, this is a fantastic one. It's got multiple lenses in it. It's really sharp and contrasty, and as Barlows go, uh, it's one of the better ones I have found for not deteriorating the view and at a really good price, $79. I believe on uh, Amazon right now. The eyepieces run between $64 and $68 depending on which size that you get. So again, if you're building up your eyepieces and you need to buy them uh, one at a time when you can afford about $60, get the 25, then get the 18, then get your Barlow. And that gives you 25, 18, 12 and a half and nine millimeter views basically. And then you can skip the 12 and the nine in that series and get the seven. And uh, by having those eyepieces together, you've essentially got 25, 18, 12 and a half, uh, 9, 7, 3 and a half. It gives you a good range. So uh, for just buying those three eyepieces in the Barlow, you'd be in about $280-ish and, uh, and have a full range of really high quality views. Uh, or you can skip the Barlow if you just want to be a purist and just start building up the whole set. They are really good, I've got them all. It's a 25, 18, 12, nine, seven, five, and there's a 2.3 as well. I don't actually have that one because I just don't like going that low in the millimeters, the views just degrade. I'll use the Barlow on the five if I'm having that rare night of just momentous scene. So that's it for uh, budget eyepieces in the one and a quarter size. The only other one that I'll mention on the budget thing is if you do have a scope that has a two inch focuser, uh, the thing that will give you a really nice wide field of view uh, and uh, for a budget is this um, Orion Q70 38 millimeter eyepiece. Surprisingly, this thing is uh, about $109 on Amazon for a two inch eyepiece. That's amazing. You can see they're giant, beefy. That 70 degree field of view just seems monstrous. And uh, it's really nice when I'm using a scope with a two inch, when I'm searching for something and I need to uh, be open while I'm looking around. I love the view through this. Uh, it is a budget eyepiece and so uh, it will get a little coma uh, a little bit of uh, stretching of the stars on the outside edges but uh, it's not bad and uh, the purists the teleview guys who've been spoiled by that view make that comment on this but the beginners starting out don't even notice it it just feels like you're sticking your head out into space with this so uh, i recommend that one for a hundred dollars it's a really good buy for a two inch eyepiece so after you've built that basic set of eyepieces and have uh, three, four or so, then the next thing that I would recommend you look at is an observing seat. This is something I don't hear a lot of people mention and talk about. Uh, this is the Vestal C-Pro 800, uh, 800LP. It's a, called a worker uh, ergonomic seat. And uh, so it's not even made for astronomy, but this one's perfect for this. It's about $100, $123 on Amazon. And what's cool about it is you can adjust the seat on the fly. You just raise it up and slide it, and you can go uh, from way down low to up high. And this is great when you're out in the field and you're moving that telescope around. You get in these different positions where the eyepiece is up here and then all of a sudden it's down here. It's very uncomfortable being bent way over in these awkward positions, but you can set that seat and just move it to where you need to be and get right at the eyepiece. Super comfortable. It makes it where you're willing and, and want to stay out at the telescope longer, especially if you take my advice and you start sketching. You will love that seat for $123. I really recommend it. The next thing that I would probably consider uh, in accessories for your telescope is a Telrad finder. Your scope probably came with the finder. It could have been a red dot or maybe it's a mini telescope in and of itself. Uh, this Telrad is just superior to anything out there other than uh, maybe the Rigel, which is similar to a Telrad. Uh, depending on your scope, you could look at either one of those. But they're both about uh, 46 to 49 dollars. And what's great about this is you look through this glass at the sky as you're seeing an open eye, and it just uh, kind of like a, a hood heads-up display in an airplane. 
it projects a reticle on the sky and so you can look and move the telescope to where that reticle is over the spot that you need to find and it just makes finding stuff way easier you're looking at a correct image the way that your eye sees it you can get it rough aligned in there and then you go to your wide open eyepiece and and zero in on the spot so i love my tail rad really the only negative to the tail rad is that uh, in moist conditions outside this is kind of the canary in the coal mine this uh, plate is the first thing to start doing up and all of a sudden becomes a pain but there's ways around that using hand warmers or uh, dew heaters which is something that you want to consider down the line now speaking of electronics and dew heaters if you do have an electronic computerized telescope or uh, dew heaters or electronics one of the things that I really recommend is to skip the Celestron power tanks and the expensive uh, astronomical batteries and go to Harbor Freight you can go online or go to the local one if you're lucky enough to have one close by. Get one of these jump packs. They are $49 or $59, way cheaper than the power tanks that the astronomical uh, places sell. And it has two of your uh, cigarette lighter plugs that all of our telescope equipment uses. It's got a USB port. It's 17 amp hours of power. And you just plug it in and charge it till it's green. And this thing runs my LX200 with a dew heater and cameras all night. Uh, I, you know, see people recommend having two or three, and I've got an extra one. But one always makes me through the night. So for the money, that's just a, a great buy and I highly recommend it. Okay, so we've talked about eyepieces and electronics, finders, your uh, batteries. The next thing I'm going to talk about that I really recommend in the beginning is a couple of good books. There's two in particular that I love uh, specifically for beginners. The first one is Turn Left at Orion by uh, Guy Consul Magno and Tan Davis. Sorry, Guy, if I slaughtered your name, but you wrote a great book. This book is uh, spiral bound, so you can take it out with you in the field. You can slip it in the Rubbermaid and uh, not worry about it getting all dude up. The pages are actually a little bit heavier than normal, so if they do get a little wet, they won't fall apart. And what's great about this is it has charts. It rates things by how uh, great that he thinks they are. And a lot of things that are in here, we're going to spend episodes talking about how to find them. But he has the charts broken down. He has one that shows how you're going to see it looking up in the naked eye with a little finder circle on it, a great place to put your tail red. And then he has different charts which uh, will show how that you would see it in typical views, like through a finder scope where it's uh, inversed and upside down, or through a Schmidt Cassegrain where it's just reversed from right to left, and then through a Dobsonian where it's upside down again. So the different views change how that you would see it, and he's got different charts showing that in all the different ways. So no matter what kind of scope that you have, you're gonna, you can look at one of those charts and say, okay, that's what I'm looking for. And it's really helpful. And the things that they recommend are good. It's things that you can typically find in your beginner telescope. And I uh, really like it. It's a great book and well-written. The other book that I really like and I don't see recommended as often, and I think it's a fantastic resource, is The Year-Round Messier Marathon by H.C. Pennington. This book is just so well written, and again, it's got lots of finder charts, and uh, it really helps you to uh, find these objects. You don't have to be doing, trying to do the all-night marathon where you're finding all 110 objects uh, in one night to use this. In fact, that's why it's called the year-round. It's just good for when uh, you want to go out there, and uh, you're going to go up in Orion, and you want to find M43, or you want to find M78, or you're looking for M79, whatever it is. You can find, flip through here, find it, and, and he'll show you how to find it uh, in a, a really nice way with good charts and uh, good finder stuff and uh, places to, to do your tail red. Particularly when you're going through the tougher stuff like the uh, Virgo cluster of galaxies or over in Leo, it really step-by-step -step walks you through how to star hop to those things. And, and I just find this to be an invaluable resource. Uh, the Messier objects are fantastic for a beginning astronomer. We're going to spend a lot of time over the next year going through as I recommend some stuff. I'm probably going to be um, recommending a lot of Messier objects because Messier, uh, Charles Messier 
was an astronomer who spent his time hunting for comets. And kind of like uh, the baby in the television sitcom from the 90s, Dinosaurs, where he had not Mama and Not the Mama, we have uh, comets and not comets. Well, Charles Messier wasn't interested in deep sky observing. He was interested in finding comets. So to not get distracted by things that were not comets, he made this famous list of all the things in the sky that in his telescope looked kind of like a comet but were not comets. And it ended up that he compiled a list of some of the best things in the night sky for amateurs to go look at because of his uh, telescope uh, abilities back then closely match uh, the things that even a beginner scope can find today. And it ends up being some of the best and brightest deep sky objects in the night sky. And so to help find that, uh, this has a really good finder guide for knocking out that uh, Messier list of objects. Many of them are also in the turn left at Orion that I talked about, but all of them are documented in this one. It's just a really good book. It's well written and I really like it. I highly recommend it. I don't know if I mentioned, both of these books are about $24 or $25 on Amazon. Again, I'll give you links in the description. Lastly, and this is last for a reason, the one accessory that I will talk about uh, next are filters. And there's a reason I talk about them last, and that's because they're the last thing that I think you should buy as a beginner. I can remember reading books and getting on cloudy nights, and I would see discussions about all these amazing filters, light pollution, and uh, this and that, that uh, seemed like they were going to work all this voodoo magic and clear the sky up and make the light pollution go away. And all of a sudden, I was going to be able to see the Horsehead Nebula with my naked eye and my three-inch scope from my backyard. And once you get into it and you start using them, you realize that that's just not the case. And for most beginners, I don't recommend it and spending money on this until you've got everything else built out. because. They do help, but just a little bit. The difference that they make is subtle, with an exception. And that one exception that I would uh, tell you to go out and get is a variable polarizing filter. And these uh, aren't expensive. You don't have to go high end. The Svobini, uh budget company that makes a, a lot of stuff for really reasonable prices, they have a good one and a quarter one. I think it's... Uh, $19, yeah, $19.99 on Amazon. Uh, and the thing about a variable polarizing moon filter is that uh, you'll see if you uh, search moon filter by itself that you'll get a lot of uh, fixed uh, shade uh, filters. Basically, you'll say a 13% or, or so filter. But depending on the diameter of your telescope, your needs for a filter can change because the more light that your telescope brings in, if you're looking through a 10 inch telescope, you're gonna need a lot darker filter than you will if you're looking through a three inch telescope. So if you get a variable polarizing, you just uh, spin this uh, filter, it's two filters actually, and by uh, turning them, maybe I can pop this up and you can see that if I turn them, it gets lighter and darker, but changing their orientation relative to one another. So what's awesome about that is uh, whatever scope you put it on, you can just dial it into the amount of darkness that suits you. What happens with the moon is that when you have this, <clears throat> excuse me, what happens with the moon is when you have a telescope objective bringing in extra light and then focusing it down onto your eye, it's just like when you take a magnifying glass and put the sun out there, it's really bright and concentrated. It's not going to burn your eye, the moon won't, the sun definitely will, but uh, it's too bright. And so it makes the moon a little bit hard to look at. And by having a moon filter, uh, particularly the variable polarizing, you can adjust it to where it's comfortable. It's basically like wearing sunglasses while you're looking at the moon, uh, but they're adjustable. So uh, really like this one, the Zlobini. Uh, 1.25 is 1999. This is the two inch filter, uh, and you can get it for about 32 to 35 dollars. Again, I'll put links. Uh, one thing I will mention if you're looking at filters and uh, you're thinking about uh, what size to buy, if you have a telescope that supports uh, two inch eyepieces, 
particularly um, if you're using Schmidt Cassegrains or refractors where you're going to have a star diagonal, then I would recommend that you spend the extra money and get the two inch eyepieces. And the reason is you can screw these into your diagonal, pop it back in, and then you can change eyepieces and look at different magnifications and never have to unscrew the filter and take it on and off. Otherwise, if you have the one and a quarter and you're popping in different eyepieces, you have to take it off and put it on the other eyepiece and swap it around. This takes a little more time. So I've gotten to where I'm a fan of the two inch because I do a lot of my viewing through a 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. And so I put it on my star diagonal and then I just uh, screw these, uh, screw the two inch in one time. The next filter that I would recommend that you consider purchasing uh, is from uh, DGM Optics and it's the NPB filter. This filter is basically a general a nebula a light slash light pollution uh, filter and uh, I spent a lot of time looking at different filters. I've looked through a bunch of them and looking at specs from the guys who uh, test these things out and this uh, NPB filter is one of the best performers and it's actually at uh, one of the better prices too. So you can get this on Amazon uh, and DGM Optics sells it through there directly uh, for uh, $75 for the one and a quarter and $150 for the two inch. But a little pro tip, uh, if uh, and I'll put links to those through Amazon, but he, uh, if you go straight to his website and buy them directly, and you, you can get them both in a combo price of 190. So if you can do two inch and you think you might want both, then go straight to his website and get it for 190. Uh, otherwise, you can go on Amazon and get your, your prime deals and get it straight to you. Uh, the individual prices aren't any cheaper uh, at one place versus the other. But if you want them both, 190, go straight to his website. I'll give you a link in the description. The last filter that I would recommend that a beginner consider after you've spent all your money on everything else and you're just dying to find something to spend your money on is an Oxygen 3, an O3 filter. Uh, the one that I'm particularly fond of is the Lumicon uh, O3 filter. And again, I'll put links to that uh, on Amazon, but uh, it's really good performer in the O3 range. What this does is it passes through the section of the spectrum that oxygen uh, in an emission nebula will put out. So it will dim your view. Uh, so the bigger telescope that you have, the better this will perform. If you're in a really small telescope, it doesn't help as much. And, uh, and that's true for all of these filters. It's why that I recommend you consider a filter last. Because uh, sometimes if you're really struggling to see something and you put this on, it'll change or allow it to just give you enough contrast that you can make it out. But uh, other times, it, it doesn't make any difference at all. Many times, uh, popping them off and on, uh, you just don't see much difference. So, uh, but they do do a little bit, and the bigger the telescope you have, the more that you'll notice that they help. But uh, I would spend my money on all of these filters last, and I would recommend them in that order. The moon filter, probably first off, they're really cheap. Get that while you're getting your eyepieces. Then get everything else that you want, and then start considering the uh, nebula filters, the O3 filter. The last filter that I see bounced around a little bit are the, the hydrogen filters, hydrogen beta or uh, hydrogen alpha for uh, astrophotography. And uh, the help on those is nominal. The hydrogen beta, uh, they call it the horsehead nebula filter. It's only really good for popping that specific uh, and a handful of other places where hydrogen beta uh, is in the spectrum that you're looking for and frankly the horsehead nebula you need a big scope a super dark sky and a clear night most people can't see that visually with the naked eye so save your money on the hydrogen filters until you get into astrophotography something we'll dabble in and talk about a little bit later but uh, really that's the last thing that you should consider when you're starting out so if you're going to do the filters get the moon then get a dgm npb and uh, then consider uh, Lumicon O3. But make sure you've got all your eyepieces and everything else first. Well, that's it. That's all the accessories that I have to talk about. Uh, it's a lot I know that I've mentioned. Don't feel like you have to go out and make a shopping list and buy all these things, but these are just things to consider, things that I have in my toolbox and I carry around with me, and the things that a beginner could actually use at a price that I think a beginner could afford. I hope you've enjoyed that. If 
you like this video, please hit the like button and help me out. And if you want to see more of what I've got coming up, subscribe. My big announcement that I haven't talked about yet uh, is uh, right behind me to help guide beginners in uh, the things that I recommended that they see. I decided that I needed a beginner size scope so that I could go try these things out for myself, see what you're seeing, because I know that a lot of you are going to end up with, you know, 60, 80, 90 millimeter telescopes and not a 10 inch or 12 inch or 14 inch uh, Dobsonian. And so uh, I bought this beginner scope to A, review it and talk about what I thought about it, and B, to actually use it a little bit and see what you're going to be seeing. Having said that, um, once I've gone through uh, the entire Messier list with this, I'm not going to need it anymore. I've got a bunch of other scopes that are uh, a little bit nicer. So I decided what would be a nice uh, giveaway for my channel is when I hit a thousand subscribers, I'm going to give this away to randomly one of my thousand subscribers. I will ship it to you at my cost if you live in the contiguous United States. Otherwise, if you want to pay shipping, I'll send it to you. But when I hit a thousand, I'm going to pull up that list. I'm going to number them and pick a random number between one and a thousand or a thousand and five, whatever's there the day that uh, after I hit a thousand. And I'm going to give this thing away. So keep watching, subscribe, and uh, maybe you'll win a free telescope as well. But uh, I will say uh, this telescope, uh, when you read about it uh, on the forums, I've seen it called a hobby killer and guys are, are calling it trash. And I have to say, I was a little bit surprised. I kind of like the scope. Uh, it gives a pretty good view. Yeah, the mount is small and shaky, but once you learn how to get around that and play with it, if you throw away the crap eyepieces that come with it and get some good ones, it's actually not a bad scope when you get it uh, collimated. And we'll talk about that in a future episode. So coming up next on my next episode, we're going to talk about how to set these telescopes up. Specifically, I'm going to set this uh, equatorial mounted telescope up and show you how to do that if you got one of those for Christmas and can't figure it out. And we're going to uh, set up an electronic scope, a MEAD ETX, uh, which is similar to all the models. And so we're going to talk about some tricks and things, how to set it up, how to get it going, and uh, may even delve into how to find that first uh, non-moon object. So uh, stay tuned on the next episode, probably uh, next week, and we will go over all of that. Thanks for watching. Look forward to seeing you next time. Find a way to say what I can't say. I'm going to spend a little time talking about equipment. But first, I feel like I should talk about the channel. I want to take this channel and shove it right up my... On this channel, I yeah. would like to say stuff without sounding like a moron.